then last but not least thank you very much I'm extremely grateful to have the opportunity to speak to you today um, even though it's taken a while and maybe we did not uh, follow our schedule religiously but that's fine because I now know that everyone who's still here you can maybe consider yourselves the veterans I don't know I'm I myself am um, very grateful also to everyone who's still on our live stream. Welcome, it's good to see you again. I mean, I cannot see you, but you can see me again, maybe after quite some time. Um, and I'm honored to be able to do so among so many influential speakers, I really am. But if you have a look at the program closely enough that you might see that there is one particular difference that might set me apart from most speakers and most speakers' experiences. When it comes to racism or discrimination, usually everyone has a story to tell. And that's easy enough because basically any human feature can be discriminated against, if we're really being honest. Sorry. <laughs> that's fine, I'll handle it. Homophobia, xenophobia, religious persecution, you name it. The list is endless. That's what one of the speakers already said today. You name it. However, I'm not here today to talk about my personal experience, but to talk about the fact that we all have prejudice. And I used to call this talk, we're all biased and that's okay. About approximately, approximately one and a half years ago, Today, I'm calling this talk, We're All Biased, and I'll leave the rest up to you, for, to, for you to decide. I remember this one anecdote vividly. A friend of mine told me how she was sitting in a restaurant with her two young children when suddenly a man entered the establishment who was sitting in a wheelchair. Her children, of course, immediately noticed this and ran towards the man, and I remember her saying explicitly, how she got nervous in that moment, thinking, oh my goodness, I hope this is going to go well. I hope they don't say anything insensitive. I hope she, he won't be offended by any way. And I think this is quite surprising. I mean, only to find that the children, all they wanted to do was say, wow, you've got such a cool wheelchair. Amazing. But to me, this is more than a fun anecdote. Because there was one particular question that stuck with me, which was, why did she get nervous in the first place? She's no racist. She doesn't actively discriminate against anyone. And yet she got nervous. Well, to give you the answer right up front, we do live, despite of what we've heard today many times, we do live in a sensitive society. And I believe that, I truly believe that, because even if you didn't have any sense of appreciation for cultural sensitivity, I think none of you would be here today. And it's true, we don't wish to offend anyone. And that's a good idea in general, certainly the right intention to be followed. Because we know that there are just so many potential ways to offend someone. They're numerous and they exist. And that often leads to the fact that we become self-conscious. We don't know how to react and what to do with that sensation. We often fail to recognize this tiny little voice in our, in our heads saying, careful, something's different here. And I mean different in the most neutral way possible. We fail to interpret this correctly. In that context, I once came ac across this quotation by Viktor E. Frankl, who says, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. We are programmed to notice differences in our environment. It's kind of an evolution, um, evolutionary law. There once was a time, very, very, very long ago, when this tiny voice inside our heads served as well, in fact, when our very survival might have depended on our ability to notice dangerous cues, such as a lion, for instance, 
and our ability to adapt accordingly, running away, for instance. And of course, that is not the case anymore. It's a very old image. Yet we still inherited this voice, and it follows us, yet we don't know how to interpret this cue anymore. So it's telling us, stop, something is different in the situation. And next time you find yourself in, the, in a similar situation, you might say, right, in between the stimulus and the response, there actually is a gap to take a breath. And within this gap lies our power to design our response. To conclude, yes, we are all biased. And that's fine. We're just programmed to notice our environment. We can act accordingly. That's all justified, isn't it? It's all very natural behavior. We have individual responses. That's all fine. And I could conclude this talk at this point. In fact, when I first gave it, I did conclude it at this point. And that might make us feel pretty good about ourselves, shouldn't it? It's all natural, cue, response. What's the big deal about this? Today, I would say, not so fast. <laughs> yes, we are all biased, but maybe we've made a mistake in this equation here. Maybe we should not look at what's different in our society, but rather question the norm. Different, again, is meant in whichever way, but actually what we do need to question is the norms in our society. It's easy to condemn acts of injustice, of inequality, elsewhere. How can there still be cultures where men and women aren't equal? How is that possible? How can children be sent to, set to, to sweatshops in order to produce clothes, for instance? How can there be countries where they eat cats and dogs? That's disgusting, isn't it? It's easy to condemn those acts. It's that much harder to question the status quo and to question our own values, traditions, and norms. Because whenever it comes down to our own uh, traditions, habits, and norms, that's, that's much harder. Everything's justified, isn't it? Because it's always been that way. It's perfectly fine. Or my personal favorite, cognitive dissonance. It sounds quite complicated. I could give you a long and elaborate definition on this, but let me just sum it up for you. I'll give you a quick demonstration. Cognitive dissonance is something like, la 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 la, no, no, I don't see it. I, don't, I have never heard of this problem before. Sorry, not my problem. And we choose to maybe get some information on the problem but then we actively choose to be ignorant towards it. And that's a divine state, actually. It's a brilliant coping mechanism because we can tell ourselves that we're educated, we're so well informed, we're educated, we're here at this conference, but at the same time, we don't have to deal with the problem. We know about it, but there actually is a gap between that. It's a great coping mechanism, I can only recommend it. And I'll get back to that in a second, but let me first introduce two hypotheses of mine that arose in that context, which is, firstly, going back to the original issue of discrimination, racism, etc. A racist, a truly stereotypical racist, I mean, that's funny in itself, isn't it? But a racist is less dangerous than the person who says they are none. Because, let's just picture this cliché racist, I mean, it's debatable if that even exists, but still, let's just picture that person. Maybe this person has not yet understood that actually we are all equal. They still need to open their eyes towards this fact, but that can be achieved. It's much harder to argue with someone who stands in a room and says, well, I'm the least racist person in this room. You see my problem here. <laughs> There's no common ground. How can you possibly debate with that person? How can you make them question their values? So that would be my first theory. 
you know, someone who actively discriminates against someone is still less threatening than the person who thinks that they are not a racist. And secondly, there might be another problem, a much larger problem than we've actually talked about today, which is maybe racism and discrimination amongst humans isn't even our real problem, where everything stems from. That might be surprising. Maybe it's the idea of feeling superior towards anything that is our real problem and that racism and discrimination actually stem from. This is what I think, and please do feel free to challenge me on this one. I think that whenever we put a price tag on a living being, whenever we say, you are worth less than you are, there's always injustice, no matter what living being this concerns. Being superior is just a human concept. It's just a concept of mind. But also, that makes us very powerful because we can challenge this idea. There are things that we are concerned, uh, that we're convinced are right or wrong. Imagine meeting me in the street, I have my dog with me, and I beat my dog, potentially to death. I'm pretty sure all of you would object. I'm quite certain, actually. Imagine me bringing a cow into this very room, or a pig, and killing it in front of your eyes. Maybe stunning it a little bit, this might work, might not work, putting a knife against its throat, hanging it up by one foot, letting it bleed out, it's still twitching, but that's okay, that's just the nervous system, it's fine. Technically, it's dead. I'm sure that each and every single one of you would object to me doing that. Question. How far away does an act of injustice have to be for us not to object anymore? We already established if it's right in front of our eyes, that's not fine. We also have this not in my backyard phenomenon that we're all familiar with, right? We still object. Well, I can still see the injustice. I don't want to, where's my cognitive dissonance? <laughs> oh, right, right, now I cannot see the injustice. I'm back in my state of cognitive dissonance, thankfully. Now let me be clear, this is not me prescribing you what to put in your food, your clothes, your makeup. That's not my goal at all. But what we're doing here, this conference, is about rights, about discrimination against living beings. Not necessarily just human beings, but living beings. How come that we pet one particular living being, even going as far as to say, this is a member of my family, whilst exploiting the other? That's a hypocrisy. We fail to align our values with our actions. And yes, I did it. That annoying vegan again. Oh, you're right. I could anticipate that. You might just say, well, Please, I don't want to see these images. Why did you even explain all that? I didn't want to hear any of this. I didn't want to see any of this. Well, guess what? Neither do I. No one wants to see that. And that's our very problem. Because we object to these circumstances, and yet we still accept them. We fail to um, align our values with our actions and we find ourselves in this state once again. Once more, just to picture the irony. This is physical abuse, I would say. And yet, this is legal because it's a pig. Let me repeat, this is legal for the only reason that this is a pig. Yes, we're all biased, but what we have to accept and what we have to face, even here during this conference in our everyday lives, is the fact that this bias is painfully random. 
you might interfere, and I'll conclude in a second, I promise. I know you've all been very patient listeners, and I'm very thankful for that. But one argument that arises very often is, but what about people? People are suffering. We're here for people today. It's racism, it's discrimination amongst humans. People are suffering, yes, they are. People are dying and people are suffering. And I'm not to take away from anyone's worry, trust me. But why are people suffering? Why are we all suffering? Could it be just as one potential solution? Could it be that maybe we lost compassion? Compassion with one another? Compassion with another living being? Respect for life? I think this is a very fitting image that portrays a society quite well. Never before have we lived in such an isolated society. There are s numerous studies on this. Even before corona hit, people would tend to say that they felt more lonely than ever before. Maybe if we learned to respect one another, if we relearned this skill, if we understood to give quite a provocative um, quotation of a very famous cartoon character, but still, maybe if we understood that with great power comes great responsibility, that would make a difference. We, on top of the food chain, as we so often enjoy to emphasize, maybe it's us who need to understand that if we're so superior, it's on us to protect the weakest. Instead, we exploit them. And this is routine practice. Let's come back to this very conference. How does this relate to us? I mean, we've already touched up on this um, hashtag, motto, you name it. The motto, Black Lives Matter, very quickly turned into All Lives Matter. But do they really? All lives matter? Or maybe that's just me, maybe I got it all wrong, maybe this isn't life. Maybe technically these living beings aren't considered living beings? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'll conclude in a second, I promise. Just to give you one more example. This, by the way, is Regan Russell, a vegan activist from Canada who died this year because she was run over by a food truck carrying pigs, just as the one in this picture. Um, she actually lost her life during her activist campaigns. And I think this sign says it all. It says, if you were in this truck, we would be here for you too. This isn't a human issue. It's something that concerns us all. So if you still think that racism is the problem, then I think you underestimate the issue. Last but not least, I think it's funny. I used to think that animal rights were something that we had to give to animals. Little did I know that living beings are born and they inherently possess these rights. It's actually us who took these rights away from them. Why? Well, because we're superior, aren't we? And there it is, that annoying vegan, again, she did it, yes, I did. And she's probably judging us, thinking she's such a better person than any of us, um, making us feel bad, telling us these stories, showing us these images, how dare she? Well, let me tell you and let me please clarify, and I mean it, I'm not. I'm not a better person than any anyone in this room. I'm not judging, I'm not prescribing anything. All I'm doing is illustrating the irony that we live in. And, well, I sure have made many mistakes and I will continue to do so, and that's fine, because this is a process. It's nothing that happens overnight. This conference is here for us to reflect on our values and to adjust. I mean, it's our motto, relate, rethink, react. But as I said in the beginning, it's easy to condemn something that happens elsewhere that doesn't concern me, that's easy. 
it's that much harder to question your real core values. And that's scary. I would even go as far as to say, if no one offended you today during this conference, if no one stepped on your toes at any point of time, then this conference has failed. Because that's what we're here to do, isn't it? Everything else is easy, but you should have been put into a position, never mind if it's during my talk or any other talk, to make you question yourself and your own values and behavior. Otherwise, we could just say, I'm so educated, I even attended a conference against racism. I'm not discriminating against anyone ever. I'm such a good person. I'm a good person. Yes, it's true. I'm such a good person. I'm the least racist person in this room. So I'll give you the perfect excuse. It's this. You can always go back to this. And that's the easy solution. Or you can join me in at least trying to adjust our core values, to align our actions with our values. That's scary, that takes a lot of courage, to be honest. But at the same time, I can only agree with what John Cage said at some point, which is, I cannot understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I, for one, am afraid of the old ones. Thank you very much.